Hey there, students. I'm going to introduce 9.2 today. In chapter nine, we're learning about comparing two different populations. And in 9.1, we introduced that idea for the first time and specifically looked at comparing proportions from two populations. And so what we're gonna do in 9.2, is we're going to compare two means um, in different populations. And specifically, when we get to using means, we're going to focus on the difference between independent samples and dependent samples, which we will do as we can see here in 9.3. Um, so again, what is the basic idea? And then in this case, what's the difference between independent and dependent samples when comparing means of two populations so that we can look at independent samples in this uh, section today. So uh, say you have, as an example, two different populations. Um, let's say students at DVC and students at Los Medanos College, LMC. And you wanna compare something about those two populations. And in this case, we're gonna focus on something that has a um, numerical measurement, which is a numerical type of data, where you might be looking at the mean values of those populations. And so a simple example might be that I think that students at DVC um, get a lower mean value of sleep every night than students at LMC. And so I could take populations uh, take these two populations and get samples from each. And when I get those samples, I would be simply looking to see if the mean value of those samples can be compared. And if it seems to have evidence to support my claim that DVC students get less sleep, meaning the mean from the DVC sample had significantly lower value of sleep per night than the mean from the LMC sample. So what does it mean for these to be independent samples? Uh, and we'll look at that in the coming slides. Um, so if when I take the samples, the individual's data from the samples have nothing to do with each other, then those are independent. So if instead, for example, um, I somehow had matched individuals in my samples, then we would have this thing called dependent or matched pairs. And again, a simple example of matched pairs is when you look at married couples and then they come in paired values. Or if you look at individuals left and right hand results for something like we looked uh, in 9.1 at reaction times uh, between your left hand and your right hand, then those would be matched pairs because each left and right hand result is paired by the person who um, gave you their left and right hand results. But if I just randomly independently have a sample of students at DVC and then independently have a sample of students at LMC, then those are gonna be independent samples. And one of the key indicators that you probably have matched pairs is if the sizes of the two samples are exactly the same because then your individuals probably came in pairs as opposed to if you randomly choose two different samples, then it's very unlikely that you would happen to get the exact same number from both without uh, making that happen. All right, so uh, let's uh, see how the key concept starts us off on this topic. This section presents methods for using sample data from two independent samples to test hypotheses made about two population means or to construct confidence interval estimates of the difference between two population means. So when we are comparing two, then the natural comparison for us will be to say that the value of one mean is larger or smaller than the value of the other, or to say that we think they're simply different than each other, or maybe even to assert that they're the same. So let me uh, begin to postulate this with some notation. They will, of course, introduce a bunch of notation. So let's say I have population one and population two. And for my simple examples, I've been defining these to be 
DVC students and LMC students. So if I have something like this going on and I'm comparing the mean values, then what I'm comparing is the mu value of population one. And again, remember that symbol refers to the mean of the entire population, not of the sample. But since we have two populations, I would put like a little subscript of one on there. And I would be comparing that to the mean value of, that's a two there, the mean value from the LMC students. And so maybe I would say that mu one is greater than mu two, or in my example, where it's the uh, mean value of sleep hours, my claim was that mu one was less than mu two or something like that. Then we would collect samples and I would get the mean value from my sample one from DVC, which we would write as X bar sub one. And I would collect and, cl uh, and calculate the mean value from my second population of how much they sleep per night. And then we would do some analysis based on those results, the number of people in my sample and things like that. And so that's the idea that you would have something as a notational claim like mu sub one is less than mu sub two. That the population mean of hours slept for DVC students is lower than the population mean of hours slept from LMC students, something like that. Okay, so this is the frame of mind with a little notational support of how we will um, use sample data from two independent samples. And then we will set up a hypothesis test like before. Once you have a claim, you can set up a null and alternative hypotheses and we will go through that process and do an example or two. Now, the other possibility that they talk about is that we might construct a confidence interval estimate for the difference. So if you are saying that mu1 is less than mu2, that would then mean that the difference between the two, mu1 minus mu2, would be less than zero. So when you are directly comparing that one is equal to the other or one is bigger or less than the other, then you can phrase that in terms of the difference between the two. And when you do that, then you could make a confidence interval for the difference between the two and then claim you know, how much uh, you would expect the mean of one to be less than or greater or equal than the other, or whether you think that looks like they might be about the same. All right, so having said that, let's, uh, let's see how we walk through this because you have to have some specifics along the way. So first, some of our setup for this kind of a problem. So focusing on the independent versus the dependent, we're now gonna define these uh, with slides. Two samples are independent if the sample values from one population are not related to or somehow naturally paired or matched with the sample values from the other population. So pairing or matched examples, spouses, left and right hands, uh, one point in time, a different point in time for an individual is an often way you have matched pairs. Like you will compare, um, for example, if you're having people take some sleeping medication, then you could compare the average amount of sleep they get before they take the medication to the average amount of sleep they get after they take the medication. But again, you wouldn't use different people for that. You would take one person and say, you would match the time that they slept before the medication to the time they slept after to see if they had uh, an increase. And then you would average out all of those differences. Um, so if you have independent pairs, then you are not taking the differences of the individuals, you are taking the mean values first and then taking the average of those two different means of the samples. If you are having matched pairs, then you are actually taking the differences of each matched pair and then taking the mean value of all of those differences afterwards. We'll explain this a little bit more in the, uh, in the coming steps. So two samples are independent if they're not matched in some way. And then of course they're dependent if the sample values are somehow matched where the matching is based on some inherent relationship, 
like one individual's before and after sleep times, uh, a spousal couple's um, measurements about something, left and right hands, things like that. So I'm making these big comparisons because as we get into the examples for 9.2, they will all be independent examples because that's what we're looking at in 9.2. But if you just assume that going in and don't think about how to make note of that, then later when you're doing matched pairs, it might be hard to discern in the problem without knowing that in advance how you would determine that. So as we're learning problems that are independent in 9.2 and dependent in 9.3, you also want to simultaneously be thinking about how did we know going in which way this was and when would we use one versus another. So we have to be thinking about that while we're looking at the examples. At least that's the best way to learn it. Okay, so now inferences about two means, independent examples. So we are working with independent samples um, and we'll look at what our objectives are there. We wanna be able to conduct a hypothesis test of a claim or, uh, and or construct a confidence interval estimate of the difference between the two. So here's a bunch of that notation. So of course, these are the ones I wrote earlier because we're focusing on the mean. But when you are doing calculations, you do need the sample size and the standard deviation. And so we have our standard notations for those. And the only difference is that for population one, you have these little one subscripts next to all the symbols and that the corresponding same symbols would be used but with little two subscripts when you're applying these to population two. And uh, so we do have some requirements as we do with all of our analysis in order for the analysis to be valid and to make sense. And so in this case, it says the values of the standard deviations of the population are unknown. Not only they are known, but we assume that they're not equal to each other, that you don't have the same standard deviation for the two populations. Now, you may recall from our earlier work in chapter seven and eight, that when you're doing a means distribution and you do not know sigma for the population, then we use a T distribution, a student T distribution. And that's exclusively what we're going to be using for comparing means. We will not be using the Z distribution when comparing means of two populations. And of course it says the two samples are independent so that's a requirement for the work that we're about to do. And that's why I've been discussing that you need to be able to think about what that means when you're going into the problem. All of the problems they will give us will meet this requirement because that's what we're studying this section. But in general, when you're comparing means, you have to think about whether your populations were sampled in an independent or dependent way. Then of course, as always, we want simple random samples. Bad data leads to bad results. We don't want to bias the data. We want to randomize how we draw the samples from the population in order to make inferences about the entire population. And you may recall that we had this basic requirement when looking at hypothesis tests and such that our samples were either greater than 30 or drawn from a normally distributed population. We have that same requirement for both of our samples that either one of those conditions are met. So it says either or both of these conditions are satisfied. The two sample sizes are both large, meaning both over 30, or both samples are coming from populations having normal distributions. And again, if you had less than 30, you could look to see if the samples were from normal population distributions by looking at their normal quantile plot and using a judgment from that plot. Now, uh, here is a good reminder also that we are now looking at the tools, requirements, and processes we will use for our projects, which are due the same day as the final exam, which is about a month from now. And you will see in the description of the projects, it is a requirement when we are gathering samples from our two populations that both samples must be greater than 30, not equal to 30, but more. So minimum of 31. And that's to guarantee that we meet this condition here uh, and that we don't have to worry about the populations that the samples are drawn from. Because once you have sample sizes over 30, 
you're good to go for all of our techniques. So here's a formula for the T distribution of the difference between two samples. Happily, we will not be applying this formula ourselves because we're going to let StatCrunch to do this. But let's uh, let me remind you that we have a standard assumption, which is that the difference between the mean, uh, the mean values of the two populations is zero. This is, uh, it says here, often assumed to be zero. This will be for all of our work. And this is the null hypothesis. Remember, the null hypothesis is usually that something has equality to it. And as we looked at for uh, proportions in 9.1, we now also do for means in 9.2, which is we assume that mu1 is equal to mu2, or that mu1, oh, that was terrible, or that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. Those are equivalent. And I think you'll see mu1 equals mu2 is the notation most frequently used by my stat lab. And mu1 minus mu2 equals zero is the notation used in stat crunch, but they are equivalent. So we are going to avoid having to use this formula um, as we use technology instead. Similarly, they talk uh, about the degrees of freedom. We wanna remember that a T distribution has this thing called degrees of freedom. When we had just one sample, degrees of freedom was just one less than the sample size. But what if we have two samples? Well, when there are two samples, um, we, we might have a, you could think there's a degrees of freedom for each, but we have to put everything together when we're doing our one calculation for the comparison. And you may recall that the larger the sample size, the better. Um, so what we want to do to be safe in our calculations, we can make a conservative estimate and say, well, since I have two sample size, I'm going to do the worst of the two for my calculations to err on the side of caution, to be conservative about the results that I get. And remember, larger sample size are better, so that means the worst of the two would be the smaller sample size. So it says a simple and conservative estimate would be to choose the degrees of freedom to be the smaller of the degrees of freedom of the two samples. So whichever one has the smaller sample size, you use one less than that sample size as the degrees of freedom for your comparison calculation. Now, it does point out here that technologies typically use a more accurate but more difficult estimate with a big formula that we are not going to use. So if you, for some reason in a problem, are asked to give the degrees of freedom, then you should, meaning that you have to figure that out yourself, you should use the, the uh, part, the, the approach given in, in option one here, which is to just use the smaller degrees of freedom from the two samples. If uh, you see degrees of freedom shown from technology, don't be thrown off by the fact that you get some number different than what you would expect, that you don't just get the smaller of the two, you might not even get a whole number. All right, so having addressed that, they talk about um, using the uh, p-value approach and using a table of values, of course, for a t-distribution, which is A3. Of course, we're going to do p-values and a t-distribution or test statistic from StatCrunch, so we don't have to worry about the tables. And when creating a confidence interval, again, as usual, your central value will be the um, sort of idea that the difference between the population means is in the middle of some range of values that you produced from your samples. And the range of values from your samples will be the difference between the samples plus or minus a margin of error. So the the only difference in a confidence interval for a single value compared to a difference between two values is that for a single value, you look at the value from your sample and you plus or minus the margin of error. And then for a difference between two, you look at the difference between your samples plus or minus a margin of error. And again, there's formulas for these, but we will use um, StatCrunch to do this for us and give us our confidence intervals. 
So the thing to remember from this is that the confidence interval is a range of values of the difference between the two population means, not what their means are, but the difference between them. So let me just give an example to illustrate this idea for a second. If I was saying that I think that um, DVC students get less sleep on average per night than LMC students, and I took samples from both populations, and I looked and crunched numbers on the difference of the means, and I produced a confidence interval, the confidence interval might be something like um, this range, we are 90% sure that the range of values between, um, let's do sleep, for example. So let's say we get a confidence interval of um, one to three hours. So again, that would not be saying that either population got between one to three hours of sleep. It would be saying that the difference between the DVC and the LMC population's sleep on average is between one and three hours. And that we're 90% sure that the range of values from one to three hours contains the true difference uh, in average sleep between those two populations. Meaning that that one gets between one to three hours more sleep on average than the other per night. Maybe one gets five hours and the other gets seven. That would be a difference of two, something like that. So the range of values is saying how big the difference between the two populations would be. I know, lots to absorb. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get, get along to an example so we can see this in action. Now there's a statement here that the p-value method and the um, confidence interval method are equivalent in that they both draw the same conclusions when being used to assess a hypothesis test or claim. And finally, we have an example with 10 slides to look at. So in our example, we're gonna consider are male professors and female professors rated differently by students? Differently, meaning on average, one gets a higher or lower rating uh, than the other as a population. Listed below are the student course evaluation scores for courses taught by female professors and male professors. Use a 5% significance level test uh, to test the claim that the two samples are from populations with the same mean, meaning that male or female on average, in general, they get the same ratings. Does there appear to be a difference in evaluation scores for courses taught by female professors and male professors? So we can see their samples here and they're not very big, clearly not over the 30 um, level for either sample. So I'm just sort of automatically thinking about the requirements and that's the next slide they're gonna talk about. So requirement check first, number one, the values of the two population standard deviations are not known and we are not making an assumption that they are equal. Two, the two samples are independent because the female professors and male professors are not matched or paired in any way. For example, we don't have male and female teachers teaching the same class or anything like that. We just have some female teachers and some male teachers. They were uh, independently chosen. Three, the samples are simple random samples. And four, both samples are small, 30 or fewer. So we need to determine whether both samples come from populations having normal distributions. So we could go through that process, but what they just state here for us to make this example move along more quickly is that normal quantile plots of the two samples suggest the samples are from populations having distributions that are not far from a normal distribution. So that's good enough to satisfy the requirements. If you looked at the QQ plots or the normal quantile plots and you saw they deviated very far from a straight line or had some systematic pattern and the samples were small, that would mean you need to have larger samples in order to use the techniques that we're gonna apply here. But they're saying that that's not required because the, the normal quantile plots suggested that they're from something close to a normal distribution in the population. All right, so having met all the requirements, <clears throat> let's look at our claim. The claim that two samples are from populations with the same mean can be expressed as, 
And this is the notation that I used earlier. That mu one is equal to mu two. Now that's actually our claim. We're not claiming one is bigger than the other or less than the other. We're actually claiming that they're equal. And as you may recall from our past um, null and alternative hypotheses tests or setups, when you claim equality, then that being untrue is simply inequality. And then your claim is the null hypothesis and not being equal is the alternative hypothesis. And so that's what they're doing in this example. So we now um, proceed with the assumption that mu one is equal to mu two or that the difference between the two is zero. So they're writing them both ways here, the way that I did here, even though they kind of did two lines there. Mu one minus mu two equals zero. So that that doesn't get broken up into two lines. So those are the two ways to write that. And often, as I said, you'll see this often done on my stat lab and you'll see this written up this way on stat crunch. The significance level is 5%, which is sort of a default, but they can set it to whatever they want it to be. Because we have two independent samples and we are testing a claim about the two population means, we use a T distribution with the test statistic given earlier in this section and for us provided by StatCrunch. So they go through some formula stuff. Let's just say that we provided those data samples to StatCrunch and it produced a T statistic equal to this for us. So we would have a test statistic. Then StatCrunch would also provide us with a p-value along with that test statistic. But in this case, they're gonna say we could use that test statistic and use a table to look up a p-value and they get the p-value here somewhere. It says technology will provide the p-value of 0 0.5172. And notice that's the p-value from technology. And they're saying here, the table indicates the p-value is greater than 20%. So right away, you can see the table is just a much more uh, approximative brute instrument and technology is really the way we wanna go. So now we have both a test statistic and a p-value. So we can have our solution or and we can help draw a conclusion here because the p-value is greater than the significance level of 0.05 in fact it was 10 times greater it was over 50 percent we fail to reject the null hypothesis if the p is low the null must go if the p is not low we fail to reject the null so then we can interpret that result because we were unable to reject the null hypothesis that the two populations are equal to each other, their mean values are equal. There's not sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the, of the claim that they have the same mean course evaluation score. Now, does that mean that this is evidence to say that they have the same score? No. You might say that it's evidence to say that if they have different scores, they don't differ by very much because if they differed by a lot, then we would expect the evidence would support that. But uh, we, we stick to the phrasing that when, you when the P is high, you fail to reject the null, that is a failure to support something with sufficient evidence. That is not sufficient evidence of the opposite. It's just a failure to support the null, uh, to support the alternative claim and reject the null claim. Now they do have a, a slide here where they show what this would have looked like on technology with in this case XL stat and it's not too uh, sort of uh, unsimilar to what we would get from StatCrunch. The tricky part about the preceding p-value approach is that the table can only give a range for the p-value. That's why it's best if we just avoid it and determining that range is often somewhat difficult. That's why we avoid it. Technology automatically provides the p-value. So technology makes the p-value method quite easy. Good, let's just stick with that. And so in this display, you can see as we would get in StatCrunch, they just gave us the p-value. 
uh, and they gave us the um, the t value as well, the test statistic. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop there and let us do a problem. This is number 23 out of 34 slides in the slide set. So let's just go ahead and do a problem um, like we might encounter in our homework and show how we would do this in Stack Crunch. Okay, so as an example for us to look at, I'm looking at number 25 on homework number 12. As we can see, this is from 9.2. Um, and so the problem says a study was done on body temperatures of men and women. So there's our two populations, men and women. The results are shown in the table. And so what they showing in this table is summary statistics from two different samples. We have the symbols they're using for mu, mu one is for men, mu two is for women. So that's just their way of showing you that they're labeling men as population one and women as population two. They only took 11, a sample size of 11 from the men and they took 59 from the women. So clearly they're showing here that you might have samples of totally different sizes. And then they're showing the mean from sample of the men, the mean from the sample of the women and their standard deviations as well in body temperature. So the results are shown in the table. Assume the two samples are independent random samples. So that's part of our requirements. Selected from normally distributed populations. We needed them to say that because we don't have enough people from the men sample to warrant doing our statistics unless we can say the population is normally distributed, but they're saying we can assume that. And it says, do not assume the population standard deviations are equal. And that was one of our requirements. Then we're supposed to do parts A and B below. Okay, so uh, this is the standard situation. So it says use in part A, use a 5% significance level to test the claim that men have a higher mean body temperature than women. So that would mean that mu1 is bigger than mu2. So as with our chapter eight work with um, hypothesis tests, the null hypothesis is always about equality. So if our claim is that mu1 is bigger than mu2, then our null hypothesis will be that mu1 is equal to mu2, and all our alternative hypothesis will be that mu1 is greater than mu2, and that's B as our uh, from our offerings here. So then they ask for the T, the test statistic. So they're reminding us that this is a T statistic. And uh, the way we get our test statistic when we have sample results to work with is we go to stat, T stats. Before we would do one sample if we were in chapter eight, but now we do two samples. And in this case, they gave us summary statistics. So we do two samples with summary. So then the tool wants the information from both samples. And again, it just says sample one and sample two. So we do need to pay attention to which population is population one versus population two. So my sample mean for the men is 97.52, and these are in temperature degrees, and the standard deviation was 0 0.77, and the sample size was only 11. And for the, the women, it was 97.29 with a standard deviation of 0 0.71 and a sample size of 59. So I enter in the fun, and then we want to identify our hypothesis test. We have equal to zero. That's the default. That will typically be the case. Uh, and then in this case, we have the difference being um, that mu1 was bigger than mu2. So I would change this to the greater than symbol. Now, if they asked us to produce the confidence interval, then I would go down to confidence interval, and I would set the confidence interval here. But in this case, we're doing the hypothesis test and I compute. So we get our little uh, summary of data. And again, it's talking about the means of the populations. It shows the hypothesis test. Notice that they frame them here as a difference instead of one being equal to the other, as we talked about before. And we have the sample difference, the difference between the sample means, 
Notice the degrees of freedom is not a nice whole number like you would expect. So if we were using the simple degrees of freedom, we would just take degrees of freedom of 10 because that would be the smaller of the two. But they use that more complicated formula and they get this degrees of freedom that looks like degrees of freedom from neither sample, but it's the combination of the two. All right, so what do we want? Test statistic rounded to two decimals. So that looks like the 0.92. I'll just type that in. So 0.92. And then they want the p-value to three decimals. So I have 0 0.187 if I round that up. Uh, three decimals, 0 0.187. So then they want us to state the conclusion for the test. And as usual, if the P is low, the null must go. If not, it does not. The P is over 18%. Uh, our testing claim level was supposed to be 5%, as it say, states at the outset of part A here. And so the P is not low enough. So therefore, we fail to reject the null. So that's going to be uh, A or C. Fail to reject the null, there is not sufficient evidence. Fail to reject the null, there is sufficient evidence. Anytime we fail to reject the null, it's because there's not sufficient evidence to do so. Okay, so then we move on to part B where they're gonna look at the confidence interval approach. Construct a confidence interval suitable for testing the claim that the men have a higher mean body temperature than the women. So, um, I don't need to enter my summary stats in again because I can just edit and go down and change this to confidence interval so that all of this stays in there. And we are at the 95% level um, because, um, well, it says suitable for testing the claim. So the default is at the 95% level and we have to decide if we want to keep that or change it. So, when you're making a confidence interval test of a one tail test, which is what we have here, then you're going to have a confidence interval and you want the tail, the one tail um, that will satisfy your claim to be the same size as the alpha level that you were given of 5%. So we're testing a claim where mu1 is bigger than mu2. That means this is a right tailed test and I want the size of the right tail to be 5%. So if I put a confidence interval in the middle and one of my tails is 5%, that means the other tail had to be 5% as well due to the symmetry of the confidence interval. And if both tails are 5%, that means the size of my confidence interval is the remaining 90%. So I'm gonna to need to change this confidence level from 95 to 90%. So that gives me a confidence interval of 90% with 5% being a tail on one side, the other 5% being the tail on the other side. That way, if my confidence interval is completely away from one of the tails and doesn't conclude equality, that's only gonna happen on one side 5% of the time. I know that's kind of complicated. Uh, so in this case, for a one tail test at the 5% level, we need a 90% confidence interval. If this was a two-tailed test about equality versus non-equality, then the total of the two tails would need to be 5%, and then I would have left the 95% confidence interval the way it was. Hopefully that helps you get through that. All right, so I set the 90% level, I compute. So this gives me my interval. And so I'm gonna put in the lower and level, and again, this is the difference between the men and the women. And they want this to three decimal places. So I'm going to grab that. And it looks like that last one needs to be rounded up to a two because it's followed by a six. And then over here to three, the one also needs to be rounded up to a two also because it's followed by a six. And that gives me my confidence interval. Okay, so then we want to try to draw a conclusion. And again, what the confidence interval now is telling us that we're 90% sure that that range of values contains the actual difference in the population means. Well, in that range of values is a zero because it goes from a negative number to a positive number. So 
part of our 90% assurity includes the idea that, well, they may just be equal to each other, which is the null hypothesis. So only if this 90% confidence interval excluded zero, would we have some evidence to reject the idea that the difference is zero. But since it doesn't exclude the idea that it's zero, that a zero is a value that may be in that range, then we fail to reject the null. Does the confidence interval support the conclusion found by the hypothesis test? So the hypothesis test says we've failed to reject the null. And we would say yes, because the confidence interval contains zero. The conclusion found by the hypothesis test that we fail to reject the null is the same as the conclusion we find with a confidence interval application. So quite a few parts to the problem. We did both a hypothesis test directly with a p-value approach. We also looked at the confidence interval. And so hopefully this will get you a good start into 9.2. Keep up the hard work.